I'm reading from Zechariah Sitchin. When time began, Book 5 of the Earth Chronicles. A startling do document, proof of the extraterrestrial gods who changed the course of human development. And of course, I'm man, so I always go to the back of the page. That's generally what I do. I watch the end of the video first. That's what I do. So before the last, not the last testament, the aftermath, last chapter, chapter 13, we read, and it's got a emblem of a coin, it's supposed to be a ram's head, doesn't look like it well. The new age has arrived in the heavens and on earth. It was to dominate the next two millennia and the astronomy of the Chaldeans had transmitted to the Greeks. When in the closing years of the 4th century BC, Alexander came to believe that he was entitled, like Gilgamesh 2,500 years earlier, to imm immortality because his true father was the Egyptian god Amon. He went to the god's oracle place in Egypt, east western desert, to seek confirmation. Having received it, he struck silver coins bearing his image adorned with the horns of the ram. Few centuries later, the ram faded and was replaced by the sign of the fishes, Pisces. But that, as the saying goes, is already history. Oh, and I have a I have an itchy nose. That goddamn ball hair stuck up my nose. Chapter 13, The Aftermath. To establish his supremacy on earth, Marduk proceeded to establish his supremacy in the heavens, a major vehicle to the end of the all-important annual New Year celebration, when the epic of creation was read publicly. It was a tradition whose purpose was to acquaint the populace not only with the basis cosmopolitan, cosmogony and the tale of evolution and the arrival of the Anunnaki, but also as a way to state, reinstate the basic religion's tenets regarding gods and men. The epic of creation was thus a useful and powerful vehicle for indoctrination and re-indoctrination, and as one of his first acts, Marduk instituted one of the greatest forgeries ever. The creation of Babylon, Babylonian version of the epic in which the name Marduk was substituted with the name Nibiru. It was thus Marduk as a celestial god who had appeared from outer space battled Tiamat, created the hammered once bracelet, in, br in, ver in brackets, the asteroid belt, and Earth of Tiamat's halves arranged the solar system and became, became the great god, whose orbit encircles and embraces as a loop the orbits of all the other celestial gods, which are planets making them subordinate to Marduk's majesty. All the ensuing celestial stations, orbits, cycles and phenomena were thus the masterworks of Marduk. It was he who determined divine time by his orbit, celestial time by defining the constellations and earthly time by giving earth to its orbital position and tilt. It is he too who have had deprived Kingu, Tiamat's chief satellite, of its emerging independent orbit and made it a satellite of earth. 
the moon. To wax and wane and usher in the months. In so rearranging the heavens, Marduk did not forget to settle some personal accounts. In the past, Nibiru, as the home planet of the Anunnaki, was the abode of Anu, and thus associated with him. Having appreciated Nibiru to himself, Marduk relegated Anu to a lesser planet, the one we call Uranus. Marduk's father, Enki, was originally associated with the moon. Now Marduk gave him the honor of being number one planet, the outermost, the one we call Neptune. To hide the forgery, and to make it appear as though it was always so, the Babylonian version of the epic of the creation called Enuma Elish, after its opening words, employed Sumerian terminology for the planetary names, calling the planet Nudi Mud, the artful creator, which was exactly what Enki's Egyptian epitaph, epitaph, that Knum had meant. A celestial counterpart was needed for Marduk's son, Nabu. To achieve that, the planet we call Mercury, which was associated with Enlil's son, Ishkur, or Adad, was expropriated and allocated to Nabu, Sabpanit, Marduk's spouse to whom he owed his release from the Great Pyramid and the communication of the sentence of being buried alive in it to that of exile, the first one of the two. Was also not forgotten, settling accounts with Inanna or Ishtar. He deprived her of the celestial association with the planet we call Venus and granted the planet the Sarpanit. As it happened while the switch from Adad to Nabu was partly retained in Babylonian astronomy, that of replacing Ishtar by Sarpanit did not take hold. Enlil was too omnipotent to be shoved aside. Instead of changing Enlil's celestial position as god of the seventh planet, which is Earth, Marduk appropriated to himself the rank of 50. He was en this, that was Enlil's rank, which is, what is 50? It's M, right? Just, just a run among Anu's 60. No, 50 is L. XL is 40. Enki's numerical rank was 40. That takeover was incorporated into the Enuma Elish by listing in the seventh and last tablet of the epic of 50 names of Marduk, starting with his own name, Marduk, and ending with his new celestial name, Nibiru. The list accomplished, accompanied each name ep epithet and the laudatory explanation of its meaning. When the reading of the 50 names during the New Year celebrations was completed, there was no achievement, creative deed, benevolence, lordship or supremacy left out with the 50 names. The last two verses of the epic stated, the great gods proclaimed him with the title 50. They made him supreme. An epilogue added to the priestly scribe 
made the 50 names required reading in Babylon. Let them be kept in mind. Let the lead man explain them. Let the wise and the knowing discuss them together. Let the father recite them and impart them on his son. <coughs> Excuse me. Marduk's seizure of the supremacy of the heavens was accompanied by a parallel religious change on earth. The other gods, the Anunnaki leaders, even his direct adversaries, were neither punished nor eliminated. Rather, they were declared subordinate to Marduk through the gimmick of asserting that their various attributes and powers were transferred to Marduk. If Ninurta was known as the god of husbandry, who had given mankind agriculture by damming the mountains, gushes, and digging irrigation canals. The function now belonged to Marduk. If Adad was the god of rains and storms, Marduk was now Adad of rains. The list only partially extant on the Babylonian tablet, began as follows. Ninurta equals Marduk of the Ho. Nurgal equals Marduk of the Attack. Zababa, Marduk of the Hand-to-Hand -hand Combat. Enlil, Marduk, the Lordship and Council. Sin, Marduk, the illuminator of the night, the illuminator of the night, sorry. Shamash, Marduk of justice. And the last, which is eight, and it's not 10 or 50, but this is all we have is Adad, Dada. Marduk of rains, excuse me, my nose. Some scholars have speculated that in this concentration of all divine powers and functions, in one hand, Marduk had introduced the concept of one omnipotent God, a step toward the monotheism of the biblical prophets. But that confuses the belief that one God Almighty with a religion in which one god is just superior to the other gods, and polytheism, in which one god dominates the others. In the words of Inuma Elish, Marduk became the Enlil of the gods, their lord. No longer residing in Egypt, Marduk, Ra, became Amen, the Unseen One. Egyptian hymns to him nevertheless proclaimed his supremacy, also cannoting the new theology that he and was now the God of Gods. More powerful of, my, more powerful of might than the other gods. In one set of such hymns, composed in Thebes and discovered written on what was known as the Leiden Papyrus. The chapters begin with a description of how after the islands which are in the midst of the Mediterranean recognized his name as high and mighty and powerful. The peoples of the hills countries came down to thee in wonder Every rebellious country was filled with thy terror. Listing their hands, which switched their obedience to Ra. Amen, Ra. The sixth chapter continued by, the by describing the gods' arrival of the land of the gods. As we understand it, Mesopotamia, and the ensuing construction of there of Ammon's new temple. As we understand it, the Esagil, the texts read almost that, like that of 
Gudia's description of all the rare buildings materials brought over from lands near and far the mountains yield blocks of stone for thee to make the great gates of thy temple vessels are upon the sea seafaring craft are at the keys landed and navigated unto thy presence every land every people send propitiatory offerings but not only people pay amen homage so do all the other gods here are some of the verses and we say amen at the end of our fucking prayers because we're saying it to Marduk. There are some of the verses from the following chapters of the papyrus extolling Amen Ra as the king of gods. The company of the gods which came forth from heaven assembled at the site announcing great of glory, Lord of lords, he is the Lord. The enemies of the universal Lord are overthrown. His foes who were in heaven and on earth are no more. Thou art triumphant. Amen. Ra. Thou art the king, more powerful of might than all the other gods. Thou art the sole, sole one, universal god, stronger than all the cities, is thy city, Phoebes. Ingeniously, the policy was not to eliminate the other Greek Anunnaki, but to control the, and supervise them. When in time the Isigila, sacred precinct, was built with appropriate grandeur, Marduk invited the other leading deities to come and reside in Babylon. In special shrines that were built for each one of them within this precinct, the sixth tablet of the epic in its Babylonian version states that after Marduk's own temple abode was completed, the shrines from the other anarchy were erected. Marduk invited all of them to a banquet. This is Babylon, the place that is your home, he said. Make merry in its precincts, occupy its broad places. By ascending to his invitation, the others would literally have made Babylon what its name, Baba Ili, Bab Ili, not Baba, Bab Ili, had meant gateway of the gods. According to this Babylonian version of other go the other gods took their seats in front of the lofty dais, dais on which Marduk had seated himself. Among them were the seven gods of the destiny. After the banqueting of the performance of all the rites, after verifying that the norms had been fixed according to all the potents, Enlil raised the bow, his weapon, and laid it before the gods, recognizing the symbolic declaration of peaceful coexistence by the leader of the Enlil. In the elites, the elites, in the elites, and Enki spoke up. May our son, the Avenger, be exalted. Let his sovereignty be surpassing without a rival. May he shepherd the human race to the end of the days without forgetting. Let him acclaim his ways. Enumerating all the worshipping duties that the people were to perform in honour of Marduk and the other gods gathered in Babylon, Enki had this to say to the other Anunnaki. As for us, by his names pronounced, he is our God. Let us now proclaim his fifty names. Proclaiming his fifty names, granting Marduk and rank of fifty, that he being Enlil's and Inertus, Marduk became the god of gods. 
not a soul god, but the god whom the other dog, dogs, gods, had to pay obedience. If the new religion proclaimed in Babylon was a far cry from the monotheistic theology, scholars, especially at the turn of, East, of this century, wondered the heatedly debate the extent to which the notion of a trinity had originated in Babylon. It was recognized that Babylon's new religion stressed the lineage Enki, Marduk, Nabu, and that the divinity of the Son was obtained from a Holy Father. It is pointed out that Enki referred to him as our Son, that his very name, Marduk, meant Son of the Pure Place. P. Jensen, son of the cosmic mountain, and in brackets P. Meisner, son of the brilliant day, son of light, or simply the true sun. The fact that all these leading Assyriologists were German was primarily due to the particular interest of the Deutsche Orient Gesellschaft, an, an, an archaeological society that also served the political and intelligence gathering ends of Germany, had conducted an unbroken chain of excavations at Babylon in 1899 until almost the end of World War I, when Iraq fell to the British in 1917. The unearthing of ancient Babylon through the remains were by and large those of the 7th seventh century before Christ. Amid the growing realization that the biblical creation's ta tales with a Mesopotamian origin led to heated scholarly debates under the theme Babel und Bibel, Babylon and Bible, and then the theological ones was Marduk or Tip Christi studies as one of the titled by Vitold Paulus asked, after the tale of Marduk's entombment and subsequent reappearance to become the dominant deity was discovered, the issue never resolved, was just let evaporate as post. World War I, Europe and especially Germany faced more pressing problems. Was it certain that is that the new age was that Marduk and Babylon ushered the circa 2000 BC manifested itself in a new religion, the polytheism, in which one god dominates all the others. Reviewing four millennia of Mesopotamian religion, Thor killed Jacobson, the treasures of darkness, identified the main change that the beginning of the second millennium BC, the emergence of national gods in lieu of the universal gods of the preceding two millennia, the previous plurality of the divine powers, Jacobson wrote, required the ability to distinguish, evaluate and choose, not just between the gods, but also between good and evil, by, by assuming all the other gods, powers, Marduk abolished such choices. The national character of Marduk, Jacobson wrote in the study titled Toward the Image of Tammuz, created a situation in which religious and politics, religion and politics between became more inextricably linked, and in which the gods, through signs and omens, actively guided the policies of their countries. The emergence of the guiding politics and religion by signs and omens was indeed a major in innovation of the new age. It was not a surprising development in view of the importance of the celestial signs and omens 
had played in determining the true becoming of the zodiacal change and in deciding who would become the supreme on earth. For many millennia, it was the word of the seven who determine the destinies, Anu, Enlil, and the other Anunnaki leaders, who made the decisions affecting the Anunnaki. Enlil, by himself, was the lord of the command as far as mankind was concerned. Now signs and omens in the heavens guided the decisions. In the prophecy text, one of which we have earlier quoted, the principal gods played the role alongside or within the framework of the celestial omens. Under the new age, the celestial omens, planetary conjunctions, eclipses, lunar halos, stellar backgrounds, and so on, were sufficient by themselves, and no godly intervention or participation was required. The heavens alone foretold the fates. Babylonian text and those of neighboring nations in the second and first millennia BC are replete with such omina and their interpretation. A whole science of one so wishes to call it developed as time went on, with special beru, best translated fortune teller. Priests on hand to interpret the observations of celestial phenomena, at first the predictions continuing the trend that began at the time of the third destiny dis, dynasty of Ur, <coughs> excuse me, concerned themselves with affairs of state, the fate of the king and his dynasty and the fortunes of the land. When the halo surrounds the moon and Jupiter stands within it, there will be an invasion of the army of Aharu. When the sun reaches its zenith and is dark, the unrighteous of the land will come to naught. I tell you, when Venus draws near Scorpio, evil winds will come to the land. When in the seventh Sivan, Venus shall appear in Cancer, the king will have no rival. And the power just came on. When a halo surrounds the sun and its opening points of the south, a south wind will blow. If a south wind shall blow on the day of the moon's disappearance, it will rain from the heavens. When Jupiter appears in the beginning of the year, in the year, corn will be plentiful. That happened this year. I'll read another chapter next time. I hope you enjoyed this. I'm losing my voice. I've never screamed so much. But you see, when time began and the aftermath, and where we are, the creation of the aftermath, that's why we all gods and servants and pigs and goats too. Thank you for watching. If you like this, please hit the like, thumbs up. And tell me if you want me to read and finish the aftermath. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. It's quite a bit. Very interesting. First time I read it. The rest I know from Rose. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> Leak Project. That's a lot. Leak Project. Rex Bear. Ciao for now. Remember, there's light at the end of the tunnel if you join the Lionel train. Choo choo! Because we get smarter as it gets tougher. Because why? We get better when we say, I want to be better. I want to try and be better. When you and I get better, we get better. Ciao for now. Talk since. Salani Gafli. Ich liebe dich. Ich. Ekes liebe I love you. Thank you to all the new subscribers. And please comment.
一つです。